Well, it goes like this: the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, and the major lift. The baffled king composing hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. All right, my name is Lori Lee, and uh, I appreciate the fact that I could be here today. She said it was an honor for y'all to hear me speak. Well, in all actuality, it's an honor for me to be here. I always wanted to be a teacher when I was growing up. It was something I dreamed about every night, you know, planned on, fought for, and it didn't happen. And I'll explain the reasons why in a few minutes, but so now I get to stand in front of people and I get to teach. And so that, that's like a dream come true for me. So it's actually my honor to be here today. What I'm gonna do is, is that I'm gonna give you a session just like I would give to anybody else, because I know this is the field that you work in, you know that every day you come and you try to help people, you know, not get infected or help people who are infected, and that's way cool. But I want to talk to you about your personal lives. And so I'm going to try to reach you on a personal level, um, not just a professional level, but a personal level, because we all tend to forget in our personal lives that we're all at risk. Okay? I've been doing this for about 25 years now. Um, I don't think it's ever gotten old to me. I still get nervous, so bear with me. Um, what we're going to do is, is that we're going to talk about HIV and AIDS first. I'm going to teach you about what it is, what it isn't. I'm going to teach you a little bit about what the illness does to the body. And then we're going to go into another histor historical aspect of HIV and AIDS. So you'll understand about a little bit of the history on it. And then we're going to go into a whole other part of it, okay? But let's talk about this, okay? HIV. Does anybody know what HIV stands for? It's an acronym. It actually stands for something. Can someone tell me what this stands for? Human. Say it. Say it out loud. Human. Oh, very good. H is human. That means that it's a human virus. Yes, cats can get a, a lock virus. Monkeys can get a lock virus. But it's mainly specifically a human virus. People pass it from one person to another. The I stands for immunodeficiency. Does anybody know what immunodeficiency is? It means that you have a deficiency in your immune system. The very thing that protects you day in and day out, that protects you from germs, bacteria, viruses. You have a deficiency in it, okay? Immunodeficiency. And then V is a virus. The difference in this virus is it's a retrovirus. There's a lot of different viruses in the world. There's colds, there's flus, there's things like that. There's chicken pox, there's measles, mumps, all kinds of viruses in the world. The specific thing about the HIV virus and a couple other viruses is that they're considered a retrovirus. And what that means is that they, they mutate. Once they get inside your body, they start to change. They change your actual RNA to DNA. And I know that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I'll explain how that happens in just a minute. Once this gets inside your body, the HIV virus, and we'll talk about how that happens in just a minute, it starts to do all kinds of crazy things. It affects the very thing, like I said, it protects you day in and day out, your immune system. Right now, most all of you in this room have a healthy immune system. And you have a immune system that's based on your T cells. Your T cells are like the generals of your immune system, okay? They're the very thing that when a bacteria or a germ or a virus gets in there, they go, oh my God, something's in our body. And they send out a message to your body. And what happens is white blood cells and all these other uh, crown fighting things and bacteria, bacteria fighting things rush to that area. Well, HIV virus is a little different in the fact that it attacks the very thing that is supposed to send out that message to your body. And that's called a T cell. And I'm not an artist, but I'm going to show you exactly what it does here. Let's pretend this is a T cell, okay? And inside your body, you have anywhere from 800 to 1200 T cells, okay, per milliliter of blood. Once this happens, this HIV virus gets inside of this T cell, and what happens is it goes in, it actually has to attach itself to a particular receptacle. You have receptacles all around this T cell, okay? There's only one, one receptacle on this T cell, which makes it a very fragile, you know, thing. Once it gets inside of here, it goes inside, and this T cell becomes like a mini factory. And it starts reproducing all of the HIV virus. And when this HIV virus comes and it fills up this T cell, what do you think happens to that T cell? It dies. 
it actually literally eats this T cell. And when it eats it and it dies off, what do you think happens then? Exactly. It splits open. And all those ATP virus that have been inside of here, they go out and they start attacking the other T cells. And when all your T cells are gone, when all of them have been destroyed by the HIV virus, that's when you're considered to have AIDS. AIDS is a very lengthy process. It could go from 5 to 10 to 15 years or more. We don't know why it differs in people. It's probably just because they do drugs, they do alcohol, they do different things, okay, that affects their immune system. But once it's destroyed and all your T cells are gone, you're considered to have full-blown age. This is the AIDS. This is the end stage. This is the terminal stage of disease that's gone on for a very long time. Does anybody know what this stands for? AIDS? I'm not going to spell it all out. A is for acquired. That means you got it. It means you acquired it. That means you did something to allow this HIV virus inside your body to destroy your T cells. You actually have to do something for it to get inside your body. Immunodeficiency syndrome. I'm going to wrap this one out. Because what happens is you don't die from AIDS. You die from the syndrome. When all of this is destroyed and your body can't fight anymore, you get a collection, and that's what this means, a collection of viruses, a collection of diseases. And it's kind of strange because people with HIV and AIDS get really weird diseases. And I'm going to kind of explain a couple of them to you. The first one I'm going to talk about is Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma is a very rare form of cancer that usually Mediterranean men get. It's like big purple lesions on your skin. But with people with HIV and AIDS, it can actually go inside your body. I had a friend one time who got a few purple lesions. It actually went inside his body, and it actually filled up in his lungs. The Kaposi's actually destroyed his lungs, and that's how he died. Kaposi's, like I said, is a very rare form of cancer. And, but you can imagine the devastating effect it has. The strange thing about Kaposi's, men with HIV get it, or AIDS get it. Women don't. We don't know why. It just affects the men. The second one that I want to talk about is PCP, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. It's also a very rare form of pneumonia, okay? And what happens is, is that everyone in this room right now has been exposed to PCP. In the inside lining of your lungs right now, you're carrying the pneumocystis carinii pneumonia bacteria is what it is. Every one of you have it inside your lungs, in the inside linings. But because your immune system is healthy, it's normal, you don't get sick from it. But when you have HIV AIDS and your immune system is destroyed, what happens is that bacteria fills up your lungs and you literally smother to death. I've had a lot of friends who smoke and I've seen a lot of people die of like emphysema and heart disease that can't breathe and things like that, COPD. But I think probably one of the worst things I ever saw was my friends die of PCP because they literally smothered to death. And it wasn't a short process, it was a very long, ongoing process. <laughs> it took a long time for them to die. And the next disease I want to talk about, the next part of the syndrome I want to talk about, is wasting syndrome. And wasting syndrome is explained like this. HIV is very, very hungry, the virus. I explained to you how it went and, you know, destroyed all these, these T cells and ate all this stuff in these T cells and it split open. It's hungry, it has to eat. So, it's inside your body. What do you think it eats first? Fat. Fat? Way cool, right? That's a good thing. Yeah, we, I mean, we're all trying to lose weight, right? That's a good thing. First, all your fat goes. Then what do you think it attacks next? What does it eat next? Muscle. 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 Your muscle starts to go. Then when your fat's gone and your muscle's gone, what do you think it starts to eat on next? Organs. Your organs. Exactly. Your internal organs. And when that happens, there is no stopping it. When it starts to attack your organs, your body literally wastes away. I've had several friends, I've actually, myself, you can see the what size woman I am, that were over six foot tall, weighed 200 pounds, and when they died, they weighed 60 or 70 pounds. I could literally pick them up myself and carry them around, big grown, strong men. Wasting syndrome, probably to me, is probably one of the hardest, most difficult ones to deal with. There is no treatment for it like there is Kaposi's or PCP or any of the other syndrome and diseases that people with HIV and AIDS get. There's no cure for this one. Because 
you have to have your muscle, you have to have some kind of fat, and you have to have your organs. And when those are gone, there's no stopping the HIV virus from attacking everything else and eating the rest of you. You literally are eaten from the inside out, okay? And those are just a very few of the hundreds of diseases that people with HIV and AIDS get. I just want to kind of highlight a couple of the really, I guess, really bad ones that, you know, people suffer from. PCP, you don't see a whole lot anymore. Kaposi's, you don't see a whole lot anymore. But you still see the wasting syndrome. You see the people with AIDS come in here, the people with HIV, and they're, they're, they can't maintain their weight. That's why we give them insure and things like that. Okay? Now, let's talk about how this virus gets inside your body. There's three ways this virus can get inside your body. Anybody name one? Blood to blood. Blood to blood. Very good. Now in blood to blood, there's some specific ways you can get it. What are those? Um, you say blood to blood, but what does that mean? Sharing needles. Sharing, sharing needles. Okay. Let's put needles. What else? Sex. Sex. No, it's not blood to blood. Blood to blood. Well, it's blood to blood. Needles. Transfusion. <coughs> what else, y'all? Organ transplant. Yeah, but that'd be part that'd be oh. part of the transfusion too. But let's put organs, okay? Organ transplants. But there's also a, a couple of simple ways that y'all aren't thinking about. Well, if we work in a in a field where the needle stick or we have to have an open Exactly, uh, needle stick, well, nurses, doctors, power. things like that. There's some other ways, though. Think about it, y'all. Every day in Corpus Christi, somebody gets one of these. What do you think it is? Tattoos. Yeah, a lot of people who give themselves tattoos, a lot of people do home tattoos and things like that. That's very risky if someone has HIV. Now, if you go to a reputable place and you check out their cleaning supplies and they clean all their instruments, that's cool. How do you know that? How do you know someone does that? <coughs> that's blood to blood. If someone else's blood is on that needle that they use that instrument and they go to use it on you and they haven't cleaned it, that's transmission. Okay? I have a question. Yeah. Um, like when you go and have your nails done mm -hmm. and they use the clippers or the cutters, if they're not sanitizing them or using new packages, that's another way you can possibly get it, right? It's possible. There's probably a very minute amount because what happens is when you talk about a needle, the blood actually kind of goes up into the needle and so it's protected. Okay. If it's actually just like on, like say it's on the little cuticle thing that push your things down, that's exposed to air, so it's going to die quicker. So while the probability of it happening is not, you know, that's very not. conducive, um, it's very, very low, okay, to be able to transmit it that way, it's not impossible, okay? <laughs> There's one more thing, y'all. When I was growing up, guys getting their ears pierced got real popular. And we would all have ear piercing parties. We'd all sit around in big groups and we'd sit there and pop each other's ears. Well, if we didn't clean the needle, we're all using that same needle, you got a bunch of kids sitting around, you know, doing each other's ears, that's blood to blood. Okay? So let's put ear piercing. Or let's say you go to a place, does it clean their instruments? Again, that's blood to blood. Okay? Needles, transfusions, organ transplants, tattoos, and ear piercing. I always tell my high schoolers and my junior high schoolers, you know, hey, don't sit around and tattoo each other. You know, don't use the same needle. Don't use the same needle if you don't push your ears. Go to a reputable place and get it done, okay? I always ask the kids, too, I'm like, okay, now raise your hand if you know anybody your age who has a tattoo. They all raise their hands. Well, in the state of Texas, if you're under 18, you're not supposed to do that. I mean, you're not even supposed to be able to go into a place and get a tattoo, so that tells me they're getting home tattoos, or they're doing it to each other, okay? The same thing with the ear piercing. Now we talked about blood to blood. What's one more way you can get inside your body? Sex. Our favorites. <laughs> <laughs> We're all humans, right? We're all sexual creatures. There's different ways in sex that you can get infected. Anybody know? Manual sex. Manual sex. There's ripping, there's tearing. There can be blood involved, of course, because there is ripping and, t ripping and tearing if there is anal sex. So that's a transmission route. What other kinds of sex are dangerous, y'all? Vaginal. Vaginal. 
The inside of a woman's vagina is like a mucous membrane. It's like the inside of your mouth. You don't necessarily have to have a cut or a scrape or something like that. It can literally be absorbed through the vaginal wall, just like the inside of your mouth, okay? Especially because you have friction. That friction is going to rub a raw spot inside of a woman's vagina, you know, inside that mucous membrane. That's an access point, okay? What's another one for the sex? Oral. What did I just say about mucous membranes? The inside of your mouth is a mucous membrane. How many times during the day do we sit there and chew on our lip, chew on the inside, bite, you know, a little plug out of our, you know, gum or something because, or the inside of our mouth because we chewed wrong or something. That's excess. If you're giving someone oral sex, that's excess to your bloodstream, okay? Anal, vaginal, oral. Now let's talk about your penis, okay? People think that, okay, it's a little more risky or not as risky for guys to get it from girls because, you know, you have to have like a cut or something like that. But we're not talking about a big gaping wound on your penis. We're talking about something as simple as you nicking yourself with a zipper. Heat rash. There's friction. That's access to your bloodstream, okay? There's one more way that you can get HIV in your system. What is that? To me, it's probably the most horrific way besides blood to blooded sex. Can we expand on that? Uh, well, I mean, <clears throat> children, babies can get it from their mother, but also adults having sex. Um, you know, men suckling at a woman's breast if he, suck, you know, sucks too hard that way. So. Mother to child. A baby can be infected while it's in the womb, in vitro, because all those fluids are passing from the mama to the baby. A baby can get it during delivery, because there's also a lot of blood and fluids and things like that, and breast milk. All these babies in third world countries were getting infected when they were two and three years old. And people didn't understand, well, oh gosh, you know, how did they get infected? They weren't infected when they were born. How did they get infected now? They're not having sex, they're not doing drugs. What's going on here? Well, in third world countries, they don't have bottles and formula. They have to breastfeed. They breastfeed up to the time almost they're seven and eight years old. If that mother had that baby and then she wouldn't get infected, that's the way that the baby can get to is through breast milk. HIV lives in white blood cells. White blood cells are usually a protector, okay? In this case, they're not. I think, like I said, probably the most horrific way that I've ever seen someone get and die of HIV AIDS is mother to child. And I think it's because that child didn't make a conscious choice to do something. Like I said a while ago, you have to make a conscious decision to have sex, to do drugs, something to get your tattoos done in a bad place, you know, to have an ear piercing party. You have to make a decision, except for being right. The child doesn't. The child had no choice. The child had no say. So to me, that's the most horrific way that someone can get HIV AIDS. Now, let's talk about the ways you can't get it. People ask me all the time, especially teenagers, well, what about kissing? What about kissing? Can I kiss him? Can I kiss her? Oh my God. You know, they're afraid they can't kiss anymore because that's their big thing then, right? Well, let's put it this way. They've done a lot of research, a lot of studies, and you would have to have, HIV has to come in a concentrated form, like Kool-Aid, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> And the only, the only things that you find it that in and concentrate is blood, semen, vaginal fluids, and breast milk. Those are the only fluids that you'll find enough of the concentrated HIV for it to be contagious. So you would have to have over like a big quart jar, like you know, big jars of mayonnaise you get at Sam's. You'd have to have like one of those full of spit, drink it all at one time, ooh, and you might get infected. Not probable, but you might. No one's that cute to kiss that long and drink that much shit, okay? That's what I tell my teenagers, okay? They also ask me things like, well, what if she's got a big gaping wound and I've got a big gaping wound and we're bleeding and we're kissing? I'm like, why are you kissing her? <laughs> if they're bleeding from the mouth and pouring blood, why are you kissing them? You know, you got to use common sense when you think about HIV and AIDS, too. They also ask me about mosquitoes. Well, what we know now is that, you know when you get bit by a mosquito and you itch? You know why you itch? because that mosquito has injected a chemical into you before it starts to suck the blood that breaks it down. That chemical 
kills HIV virus. Thank God. Because you think about it, if we, if we can get it from mosquitoes, who would, who would uh, be dying and talking like flies? Children. Children are always out in the morning, always out at night playing, always getting mosquito bites. Always. We would have no children in this world if you could get it that way. But what we know now from laboratory studies is that chemical kills HIV virus. People say, well, that's cool. Why don't we just shoot at people with AIDS with that chemical? Well, that's not cool either because what happens is anything that kills HIV virus, bleach, air, that chemical that that mosquito injects, any kind of chemical that would kill HIV or any kind of air that would kill HIV would also kill the host. It would kill that person, okay? These should I take, do things like take it out of their body, like do a, tran like a blood transfusion, take all the blood out, heat it up, and then put it back in. Well, we also know now that when HIV gets into your body, it doesn't just go into your blood. It goes into everything that you have. It goes into your bone marrow. It goes into your bone. It goes into your tears, sweat, saliva, feces. And if you were to test all of those in a person with AIDS, they would all have trace amounts. But as I said, blood, semen, vaginal fluid, and breast milk are the only ones that are concentrated enough for it to be contagious. Okay? Now, what can we do? What can we do to protect ourselves? What do you think? Not have sex? That's not realistic, is it? We're all sexual creatures. We're all sexual human beings. That's not realistic. We have a need to procreate. That's what we do. That's the way we're designed. So people are going to have sex. So what can we do? Get tested. I heard someone say safe sex. <clears throat> there is no such thing as safe sex. There is this, though. This is, if you remember anything today, I want you to remember this. I don't want to ever hear safe sex again. There is no safe sex. Mental, physical, anything. There's not. There's responsible sex. And what that means is talking with someone. First of all, I'm the kind of person I'm like, how can I get naked with someone if I didn't talk to them first? Some people can, though. I don't understand it, but some people can do that. Okay? So what you want to do is if you want to have sex with someone, you need to be responsible about it. You need to be able to talk to that person and say, look, you know, I don't have HIV or I don't have Hep C and I don't have these diseases. You know, what about you? Let's talk about how we're going to protect each other. If you truly care about that person and yourself, you'd want to protect yourself, right? You'd want to protect that person. So you want to practice what we call responsible sex. And that means condoms. And when I say condoms, though, it's not like, you know, people say, okay, well, I guess we'll get condoms slapping on. Well, no, you can't. Condoms are like shoes. Would you go into a shoe store and go, okay, those will fit. Well, I wear a size 7. I wouldn't grab a size 10, would I? Guys. <laughs> I'm messing with y'all. No, it's just like shoes. You got to pick them out. You got to try them on. You got to see what fits. You got to see what works for you. And then you got to learn how to put one on. There's a specific way. And I know that most of you are in education, right? So we've all had what our <coughs> responsible condom demonstrations and things like that. We've all had that, right? You got to pinch that tip. You pinch that tip. That's all you got to remember. You pinch that tip, that condom should not come off. It should not break. You always want to buy ones that are latex. You never want to buy ones that are sheepskin. Sheepskin are designed to, to catch sperm so you won't get pregnant, but sheepskin have bigger holes and the HIV virus is very, very small. So you can actually go through that sheepskin. So you always want to make sure it's latex. What else can we do? What if we use needles? Clean needles. You want to clean your needles. You don't want to share needles. You don't want to do the tattoos from an irreparable place. You don't want to do the ear piercing from an irreparable place. You want to make sure that you make a conscious decision and a conscious <coughs> choice to protect yourself. And not only protect yourself, but protect other people by having responsible sex. Okay, and this every time. People think this stuff, oh, well, I've been together with this person for, you know, a couple months. We could quit wearing condoms. I just said a while ago we're all sexual creatures. People make mistakes. Okay? People do things we shouldn't do. People do things we want to do. So it's up to you individually to take care of your own body. You know, if someone says, well, we've been each other together for like two or three months. Let's quit using condoms. No. Because what if they cheat? What if you cheat? What if you bring it home? 
And we have to think about things like that. We don't want to, but if you make an effort to think about this and protect yourself, you'll never get infected. And that's a very cool part about it, barring rape. Okay, let's talk about the history. Before I get into the history, I want to make sure that you understand exactly what it is, exactly what it isn't, and how you get it, how you don't. Are there any questions about anything that I've talked about so far before I go through a little bit of the history of it? No? Okay. See, so I don't understand, right? Okay. All right. Now, HIV probably started back in the early 80s. They believe that back in 1978, when we were having, no, 1976, when our country was having its 200th birthday, what happened was is that we had a lot of people come in from overseas. A lot of people came into the ports in New York, a lot of people came into the ports in California. That was our, what, our 200th birthday. It was a huge celebration here in America. A lot of people came in. Exactly five years later is when we saw our first HIV and AIDS, HIV and AIDS cases. We know now that that's probably when it came to America in great numbers, is during 1976. I was 68 years old. They didn't identify until 81. I remember when they came out and said, there's a disease called AIDS. You know, five or six gay men in San Francisco were dying. And what I remember thinking about at the time was that, oh, okay, that is so sad that those people have that disease. But because of the way they brought it out, because the way the United States portrayed it, you didn't think you were at risk. And we know now that when the gay guys were dying, those, those few in, in California, there were women and children in New York who had the same symptoms, the same type of illnesses, but because they weren't homosexual, they never identified them as HIV AIDS. We know now they were. We know now they were. The, the United States of America did a very strange thing we usually do when something like this happens, okay? We were the only country in the world to give it a personality and to give it a face. We gave it a gay personality and we gave it a homosexual face. And when we did that, you know what people did? They turned their backs. Oh, that has something to do with me. I'm not gay. I'm not homosexual. I don't have to worry about it. When we did that, the United States of America, we let loose a monster. We let loose a monster. We didn't understand at the time, now we know. Like I said, there were women and children dying too, but they just weren't identified. I can remember being a very, very young woman. Back in 1985, I was the mother of two small children, and I was in the dating scene. I remember reading about it. I remember Rock Hudson dies of AIDS. Oh my God. I know some of you aren't old enough to even know who Rock Hudson is, but he's a big <laughs> movie star. And when it came out, it was like this big brouhaha. I mean, nobody knew what to think because he was this big, strong, girl movie star. You know, and everybody kind of freaked out about it. But I remember that headline, I remember thinking, oh gosh, you know, maybe, maybe he was one of the ones who did drugs or something like that. You just didn't know. You didn't think about it too much because it had nothing to do with you. It only had to do with people who were gay or the occasional IV drug user. Well, like I said, I was a single parent of two children. My children were probably two and three at the time. And I can remember what my mother told me. Mom said, Lori Lee, you know, you're single now, you're divorced, you got two small kids. You know, um, it's gonna be hard for you to you know, find a new husband or, or a new mate. Maybe you should go to church. Maybe you'll meet a nice man there. So I did. And not only that, I wanted to raise my children in the church. I wanted them to understand, you know, the whole Christianity thing, bless you. And um, I didn't feel like I had the right tools and the right education to do that, so I did. I found a home church, I started taking them, and when we were there, I met a man. His name was David. He was the pastor's son, and he was also the music director of the church, you know, the guy that leads the choir and does all the music. And we started dating. It's like I said, his name was David. And when we were dating, David told me a lot of things about himself. One of the first things that David told me was that he was a graduate of Rush University. Well, I was impressed by that. I mean, I was a young woman. I thought, gosh, you've got to be really smart to get into Rice, you know? And, and I was impressed. I mean, he was a smart dude. The next thing that David told me was that he was an entrepreneur. He sold gray market cars overseas. 
and he was always flying back and forth to Europe and different places. Well, I was a young woman. I was impressed by that. David told me that he didn't do drugs and he didn't uh, drink. That was really important to me because I didn't want people who did drugs and who were alcoholics around my small children. So there were two and three at the time. So the next thing David told me was that he loved me and he wanted to marry me. And so we did. We got married probably about a year, a year and a half after we started dating. And the day that we got married, we moved to another state. We moved to Tennessee. And it seemed like from that moment that we moved to Tennessee, mine and my children's lives pretty much turned into a free-for-all. Because one of the first things I found out about my husband was that he had told me several lies. My husband had actually not gone to Rush University. He'd gone to one class there. Um, he'd actually been in prison during the time he should have been in college. And he'd been in prison for embezzling. I also found out that my husband found a needle in our bedroom one day laying on the floor. And I couldn't understand why this needle was in our bedroom because I had never seen a needle like you get a shot with or something like that outside of an office, a doctor's office. And I remember asking Dave, I was like, oh my God, where'd this come from? You know, how could this be here? And he said, well, I recently joined a club and I'm using steroids. Well, this was long before Lyle Alzado, and I'm sure a lot of you don't know who he is either. But he was a famous football player and he used steroids and he got, he got cancer. He got really bad cancer. And that's when they started correlating steroids and cancer in men, okay? But this was before then. So I remember telling David, look, I don't care what you're using, but you can't leave needles laying around because whatever Elizabeth or Seth would have gotten a hold of it. What if they would have got stepped on it or something? They could hurt themselves. And the next thing I found out about my husband was that I thought that we were doing fundraising for churches. We would go all over the eastern seaboard and we were doing pictures, directories for churches. Well, what I found out was that David was using his biblical knowledge because I told you he was a pastor's son and he was actually bringing the churches off. That was probably one of the hardest things for me to deal with because in my head, in my heart, I couldn't even figure out like who can rip off Jesus? I mean, who can actually use that kind of knowledge and rip a church and rip God off? Because to me it was the same thing, you know, ripping Jesus and God off. And I was so, totally devastated by these, these lies. But the next lie was the one that probably hurt me the most. Was I found out that my husband was having an affair with an 18-year-old boy. That one was quite shocking because I didn't understand homosexuality. I had never been exposed to it from what I, from what I understood. I knew nothing about it. All I remember thinking in my head when this 18-year-old boy came to my house was that, oh my God, I married a homosexual. Well, I didn't want to be married to a homosexual. I didn't want to be married to a liar. I didn't want to be married to someone who had presented themselves to be something they weren't. And so you know what I did? I decided to leave David. And I don't know why I did this, but I remember it was on my 27th birthday. I was standing in front of the mirror. I was getting ready to go to work. I was working three jobs trying to take care of the children because David was useless as far as working. And I heard a commercial in the background. The children were in the living room watching TV cartoons. Is said, aim high, Air Force. So that's what I did. I thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to join the Air Force. And so I did. On my 27th birthday, I went down to the recruiting office. I joined. And I can't explain it to you other than to say to you that, thank God we live in America. Because all I kept thinking about was that all these horrible things are happening in my life right now. And my marriage was falling apart. And I found out that he wasn't just having an affair with an 18-year-old, but it was a whole bunch of different people. And all I wanted to do was just leave him and get away from him. And so I thought, okay, I'll join the Air Force. You know, I'll make a career out of it. I can take care of my children. It'll provide a future for us. And I can remember the day that I was sworn in. It was actually the children's birthday of our Constitution, not of our United States, but the Constitution. They were having all these big parades and stuff outside. And I remember feeling so <coughs> honored to stand there and pledge my, my oath and, and my life to the United States to protect it, to pick a president. And I remember thinking, God, you know, only in America can your life be so bad and then you could just turn around and then all of a sudden you have a lot, your whole life right there in the palm of your hands. It's just waiting for you. And that's how I felt. I thought, oh my God, this is so exciting. You know, I'm gonna go into the Air Force, do this, do that, take care of my babies. And I was so, so thrilled and excited to be able to do this. And 
I even remember you taking my physical and having to lift 100 pounds, which is probably the hardest thing I ever did in my life, because I'm a small chick, right? But I, I even did that, because I was so determined to do this. Well, you know what I did next? I had long hair about down to here. I went and shaved my head. Like Demi Moore, I guess, in that show. <laughs> I don't I guess it's for her movie, okay? But that's what I did, because I thought, you know, I have long hair, I don't want to get in trouble in the Air Force. I'm going to cut all my hair off, and I did. I shaved every bit, it was like this long, all over my head. Well, about two weeks after that, and about two weeks before I was supposed to be shipped out, my recruiter called me and told me that they had lost my blood test, and they needed me to come in and take another one. So my recruiter came and picked me up. He took me to the big military processing center in downtown Dallas on Katie's. We went in the front door. We started going down a long hallway, and we passed the lab. And I remember telling him, he was like a big Marine guy because there's different, you know, uh, enlisted guys there. And I remember telling him, hey, dude, I'm supposed to go in here and get my blood test. He's like, no, you need to come with me. He said, we're going down, going down here. I said, okay. So I followed the big Marine guy. We get to the end of the hallway. He puts me in a little bitty room about the size of a small bathroom, about a half bath, and he locks the door. And he starts guarding the door. And I'm, I'm looking at him, and, and He's looking at me, and I said, well, maybe you have me confused with someone else, because I'm just here for a blood test, because I started getting kind of nervous as he and I in the room. I started trying to talk to him, and I said, I need to go back to the lab and get my blood test, and, you know, y'all lost it, and, you know, I really need to get out of here. And he's like, he wouldn't talk to me. He wouldn't say anything to me. He just reached around and locked the door behind him. Well, that made me even more nervous. So I started kind of chattering with him, but he still wouldn't talk to me. He wouldn't tell me anything. He just stood up against the door like he was guarding it. Well, within about five minutes, another guy came in. He had a long white coat on. I'm assuming he was a doctor. I, I'll never know because I don't really remember this part too much. But he sat down and he started talking to me. He said, we brought you in here today because we wanted to tell you that you tested positive. I was like, cool. And he said, well, you tested HIV positive. And I was like, you see, because in my mind, he kept saying positive. Positive to me meant good. Negative meant bad. So I kept thinking that he was trying to tell me I had good positive blood. And I had never heard of the term HIV before. So I kept thinking, God, this is great. I have good blood. This is why they brought me here today. I have good positive blood. And he's like, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. He said, what I'm trying to tell you is that you tested positive for AIDS. You have AIDS. I remember sitting there for a couple of minutes, just not even able to think, because all I can remember about AIDS was that Rock Hudson dies of AIDS. All I can remember about AIDS was that they talked about some gay guys in San Francisco who were dying. And I didn't understand. But then immediately my mind, my mind went to <coughs> the husband I had just left. <coughs> and I thought, oh my God, oh my God. Not only did I marry a homosexual man, but he gave me eggs. And I told that doctor, I said, look, I said, I'm 27 years old, and I have two little children. And this morning, I was filling out my will. I was trying to be a good, responsible parent, right? And I thought, I'm going to go to basic training, and just in case something happens, I need to have all my ducks in a row, right, my paperwork in order. And that's what I had been doing that morning before the recruiter came, and I told him that. And he said, well, it's a good thing you were filling out your will. He said, because you have six months to 18 months to live, and then you're going to die. I remember not being able to breathe. I remember not being able to speak. All I remember is them taking me to another room. And has anybody ever seen that movie, Outbreak? You know, those big hazmat suit things they have on? Well, there was a guy sitting there with all of his stuff all laid out on his table. Well, he was going to take my blood just to confirm it. Again, I had to do one more blood test just to confirm it. And he had that big hazmat suit on. And I remember just thinking, oh, God. And it was weird because when I looked through his mask, he was sweating profusely. He was scared of me. There was this big Marine guy and he was scared of me. And I remember thinking to myself, welcome to the world of AIDS. Welcome to the world of AIDS. I remember them taking my blood. I remember them 
taken me out the back door. They wouldn't let me go back out the front. The recruiter said, take her out of her, take her out of here, get her out of here, take her home. And they let me go outside. But when I got outside, there was two other Marines kind of like leading me, you know, to the car. And I remember just breaking away from them. And I remember going over to a fence and putting my hands through it. And I never said, why me? I never said that. I've never said it to this day. But I do remember saying one thing. I remember saying, God, help me. God, help me. What am I going to do? I have two small children. How am I going to go home and tell my parents that not only that that life I had in the palm of my hands is gone, but the bottom had fallen out, but that I was going to die. And not only was I going to die, I was going to die of that disease, the one that everyone was talking about, the one that you know, people were burning their houses down and kicking them out of town and taking their children away. That's all that kept running through my mind a whole hour and a half on the way home. Was who was going to come in and take my babies to me? What person was going to come and take me? They also were t thinking about taking us and putting us on an island. I can remember, you know, within a couple of days, Mommy and I watching TV and uh, for Winfrey, they said, well, we're just going to take them all and put them on an island. We used to do lovers. I remember asking Mom, I'm like, Mom, how can they just come get me? How can they just, like, take me and just put me there and just take me away? And I remember Mama saying, over my dead body and over your father's dead body, will they ever take you away from us? I knew then that my life was going to be very different <coughs> than most people with that age. First of all, my parents didn't turn their back on me. I remember telling Mom that day when I got home, Elizabeth and Seth started running out to me. Mommy's home, Mommy's home. I told you they were two and three at the time. And I remember screaming at my mother to keep them away from me because I did not understand HIV AIDS. I thought, what have I done? Have I hurt my children? Have I given it to them? I mean, you'd heard about hot tubs and, and kissing and all these things. And all I could think about was, you know, blowing on their little bellies when I would play with them. And I thought, oh my God, did I give them AIDS like that? And, and I was just remember being so scared that I just screamed out at my mom, don't let them come near me. I remember telling mommy that I had AIDS. I remember her grabbing me and just holding on to me so tough. You know how your mom kisses you and she feel like she wants to just take your boo-boo away? Well, that's what it felt like. My mom couldn't take this boo-boo away. Well, my father, he's a big, strong jock, <laughs> never comes home early from work. He's in construction, right? Well, about that moment when I'm telling my mom I have HIV AIDS and I'm dying, my dad comes pulling into the driveway. So I started begging my mom. I'm like, Mom, please don't tell Daddy. Please don't tell Daddy. I'll pack up my stuff tonight. I'll leave in the middle of the night. Just take care of Beth myself. I didn't want my parents hurt. I didn't want my parents' house burnt down. I didn't want my brothers and sisters to lose their jobs. It's all that stuff was going on. More than anything, I didn't want to be an embarrassment to my family, especially my children. My mom wouldn't let me leave. She wouldn't let me leave. She stayed up all night for the next week just to make sure I would not leave in the middle of the night. Because I wanted to. Because all I could think about was all the ways I was fixing to hurt them. If people found out. And I remember for the next year, after I found out, I would lay in bed every night and I would think to myself, oh my God, you know, who's going to burn my house down? Who's going to pick at my children's school? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Who is the wolf in sheep's clothing who's going to come in the middle of the night and take my babies away from me? Because that's what they did back then. They took women's children away for no reason other than they had HIV AIDS. And then one night I was laying in bed, and it dawned on me I'd been asking myself the wrong question. I should have been asking myself what would happen if I didn't tell you I had AIDS. 
And to me, that was much scarier. Because I thought, God, you know, all I did was go to church. All I did was fall in love and get married. That's all I did. I didn't do drugs. I wasn't a prostitute. I wasn't promiscuous. I wasn't any of those things. All I did was fall in love and get married. I thought, people have got to know that this is what it truly is. It's not about being gay or being an IV drug user. It's about being human. And it's about making choices that can lead us in a different path. And I remember seeing Ron White. I don't know if any of you remember him or not, but he was a young boy. I remember watching him testify before Congress. And I'm thinking, oh my God, if a 12-year-old boy could sit there and do that, I'm a grown woman. I know I can do that. So I decided to go public. The first year, they didn't show my face. In fact, they called me Annie for the first year because I was so afraid of what would happen to my children. My children were in school now. Years were going by. And I thought, you know, I don't want anybody in front of the school picketing. I don't want parents to find out. A few close friends knew, and that was about it. And then in 1990, <coughs> 91, it was going to become the, the year of the woman with AIDS, women and AIDS. They were going to focus on that. And so I decided to show my face and to use my real name for the first time. And when I did that, it was great for me. It was good for me. But it was horrible for my children. Because what happened was, is that since that moment, since I found out until this moment, a lot of good things have happened and a lot of bad things have happened. One of the most important things I can tell you is that I don't mind having HIV AIDS. I don't mind it. You know, there are all kinds of diseases out there. There are thousands of diseases out there. I'm kind of feel fortunate that I have this one now and not some of the others. But I also thought to myself, I don't like the baggage. I don't like the extra baggage that went along with it. I'm a white girl. I never, I thought I knew what discrimination was, y'all. I had no clue. I had no concept of what discrimination was until my children started being the target of it. I can remember when it became public that I was that person with HIV AIDS, that I was that woman. I can remember Elizabeth was eight years old. This was the very first thing that happened. And it was new kids on the block. And she wanted to have a birthday party. I was a brownie leader. I had about 12 little brownies. And all the brownies had sort of kind of quit coming because their mothers found out that I was that woman with AIDS. The girls got off of Storm Channel 6. They were not happy that they had reported that there was a brownie leader with AIDS. Um, I remember Carolyn Connolly telling them, yes, she is. You leave her alone. You touch her. I will come after you. But they didn't help in my home life. It helped my professional life, my mission, but it didn't help in my home life. Because what happened was, the day of that party, Mimi had made Elizabeth this real cute little vest with all the new kids on the block's names and all this stuff on it. And I'd gotten the VHS of the new kids on the block video. And we had the cake and the party favors. And I was so excited because it was her first party. And it was going to be a summer party. And right at the last minute, all the girls started calling with all these different excuses why they couldn't come. <laughs> and so I ran around the neighborhood and I begged people, my neighbors, I said, please don't, don't, don't do this to Elizabeth. You know, don't hurt my daughter like this. She just wants to have a party. She's eight years old. But they wouldn't come. Finally, I found two little girls and then one of the other brownie girls came. So there was three little girls there. But I knew when my daughter looked in my face, I knew that she knew that they, can't, they weren't coming because their, her mother had AIDS. I knew that. And she knew that. And it broke my heart to think that I could hurt my children that way. Well, the next thing that happened was that they started targeting my son. My children were beaten. They were made fun of. They were discriminated against in school. CCISD probably broke every civil right my children ever had. 
And it was a really horrible experience. I can remember Seth. He was really became a target. The girls weren't too bad with Elizabeth. They weren't that mean. They were mean, but they weren't that mean. The boys, y'all were merciless. I mean, just merciless. The boys made up a song. The boys across the street, his name was Oscar, and he had a, a friend. And every day, when Seth and Elizabeth would come out of the house to go to the bus, you know the song, The Adams Family, da 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 da? That one? Yeah. Well, they made up a song called The AIDS Family. And every day, when they'd come outside and go on the bus, those two boys would be singing that song. And it'd have lyrics in it like, your mom's a whore with AIDS, you know, and it, it was horrible. Seth would get beaten. The whole time they were beating him up, they were calling me a whore with AIDS. And this went on for a long, long time. I had to move the kids and move schools and change schools, and there were bullies, and it was a constant battle. I remember getting constant calls from the school. You know, they beat Seth up again. They beat Seth up again. They beat Seth up again. So while for me, my mission was going on, my children were being devastated. There were people who didn't want them in the school system. There were people who felt like it was their duty to tell other parents that my children played with, oh, It was a constant battle. All I wanted was for my children to love me and be proud of me and not be ashamed of me. So I kept doing what I kept doing. And then finally, Elizabeth and Seth got in high school. And Seth got big. And nobody beat up Seth anymore. Because he put muscles on him and got bigger. And now that I think in high school, kids kind of change a little bit. And Bob and Seth started making more friends. And Fred started to come over to the house. But I think when I look back on that time, it breaks my heart. Even to this day, when I heard about the boy in Flower Blood committing suicide because he was bullied, it broke my heart. Because all I could think about was the bullying and the horrible things that Elizabeth and Seth had to go through, all because of another mother. Like I said, a lot of good things have happened since that time, a lot of bad things. I'm fortunate now, and one of the good things that happened is that I didn't die in six months to 18 months. This September 25th will be 27 years that I've been infected with HIV. I'm the longest surviving woman in America who has never, ever gone into full-blown AIDS. Used to hear about those people, those one in a million people who would be carriers but never get sick with it. One in a million. Well, I would do my one in a million dance every day. I guess it worked, because I'm still here. I appreciate the fact that I can do this. Like I said, I always wanted to be a teacher when I was growing up. And when I was in the Air Force, that's what I planned to do, was go ahead and get my college education and get my teaching certificate. And it have been, but look, now my dreams still come true. I still get to come and talk in front of the class. I still get to teach. So my dreams came true. And not only that, my children today are beautiful. They're grown. They've given me five grandchildren. Elizabeth gave me three. Seth gave me two. They're the loves of my life. And I feel so thankful and so blessed to still be here still be fighting, to still be working my mission. And about three or four months ago, something extremely amazing happened. My daughter, after I retired, decided to pick up my mission and to take it on as her own. I have never been more proud or felt more respected and more loved in the moment she called me and told me she would be working with these great people, with this great organization. My heart overflows. That when I'm gone, someone will carry it on. Thank you, Elizabeth.
And I want to thank all of you for the work that you do every day. That means the world to me. I can't do this anymore. I would love to be up here in the trenches like I used to be every day, day in and day out, but I have wasting syndrome, which is what we talked about while we cut. And so it's very difficult sometimes for me to do that. My stamina is not what it was. But I appreciate the work that y'all do. I appreciate the effort that you put into it, the love, the care, the compassion, the empathy that you have to have. I've always said that if you come to work for the foundation, the Coastal Bend AIDS Foundation, you're a gift from God. You have to be. Because what person in their right mind would go to work for an AIDS Foundation? You risk everything. You risk the stigma. You risk discrimination. You risk losing family members and friends who don't understand what you're trying to do here. And so for that, I thank each and every one of you that go out and carry on the mission that we have. I want you to all keep one thing in mind. This is what it's about. <clears throat> we have two missions here. One, we take care of people with HIV and AIDS. We provide services, but more importantly, our business is to go out of business. The day the foundation can close its doors means that you've all done your job. Because AIDS won't be here anymore. It won't be a problem. It'll be accepted or it'll be a vaccine or something. We're the only business in business to go out of business. If you keep that in your brain, you'll be okay. And one other thing, when you go out, don't just educate their mind. I could educate your mind all day about HIV. I could teach so many things about it. It's important for you to educate their heart as well. If you don't do it too far, they'll be like all those people in the beginning. They'll feel free to turn their backs. They'll feel like they're not involved. They're not at risk. Like I said, I appreciate the fact that I can come and do this. Thank you so much. It means the world to me to still be able to fulfill part of my mission. And uh, I wish you all great success. And if you find those people out there that you look for, you get them tested, you get them educated. And if there's any questions that anybody wants to ask me, please feel free. You can ask me about the illness itself. You can ask me about the virus, how you get it, how you don't. Or you can ask me about my personal life. OK, I've just told y'all some of my deepest, darkest secrets. So anything that you want to ask me is fair game. Thank you again so much for having me, though. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. For there any questions? Cool. Then I'm going to assume that all of you just had your vaccine, so I tell kids, if you have no questions, that means you know it, right? And as soon as you walk out that door, it's like you got your booster shot. You just got your vaccine. So if I see you over in the client area, I'm going to kick your butts. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. Thank I appreciate you. it.